Hello everyone, I am Dr. Deepika Malik. Today's topic of discussion is industrial production of ethanol. World ethanol production rose to nearly 13.5 billion gallon in 2006. Today, various kinds of crops are utilized for ethanol production. In the United States, the world biggest ethanol producer, ethanol is mainly produced by corn. Brazil, the second biggest ethanol producer, utilizes sugarcane as the ethanol substrate. European countries produce ethanol from beet. Also, intensive studies are going on for ethanol production from lignocellulosic biomass. Ethanol production from lignocellulosic biomass could find a way to utilize agricultural waste for ethanol production. What is ethanol? Ethanol is a type of alcohol produced by fermentation of sugars and starches or cellulosic biomass. It is a clean burning high octane fuel that is produced from renewable sources like sugar, starch and renewable wastes. Ethanol is a flammable and oxygenated hydrocarbon liquid. The primary feedstock for ethanol production is corn. Secondary feedstocks include sugarcane, sugar beets and cellulose. Chemical formula for ethanol is C2H5OH. Now let us see physical properties of ethanol. It is a colorless liquid with molecular weight of 46. It gives pleasant alcoholic odor detectable at 49 to 716 ppm. It is miscible with water and most organic solvents. Its boiling point is 78.3 degrees Celsius in the anhydrous state. Melting point is minus 114.1 degrees Celsius. Specific gravity is 0.789 which indicates it is lighter than water. Vapor density is 1.6 which indicates that it is heavier than air. Now let us discuss the principle of ethanol production. Alcohol fermentation or ethanol fermentation is a biological process in which sugars such as glucose, fructose and sucrose are converted into cellular energy and thereby produces ethanol and carbon dioxide as metabolic waste products. Since yeast performs this conversion in absence of oxygen, alcoholic fermentation is an anaerobic process. For many years the alcohol was produced by chemical means through catalytic hydration of ethylene. However, in the developing countries, microbial fermentation processes are preferred for the production of alcohol. This is mainly because of the cheap raw materials available. Ethanol is now a dish produced by using sugar beet, potatoes, corn, cassava and sugarcane. Now let us discuss about the microorganisms used in alcohol fermentations. Organisms are selected on the basis of following parameters. The organism should have high growth rate and fermentation rate. It should have high ethanol yield production capacity. The organism should have high osmotolerance that is the ability to grow in an environment with a high osmotic pressure. The organism should be able to withstand low pH and high temperature ranges. The selection of the organism also depends on the nature of substrate used. The organism should also withstand high concentration of the substrate that is glucose and high concentration of the product that is ethanol. The table shows few examples of the yeast and bacteria used in the production of ethanol and the respective sources of carbohydrate. The commercial production of ethanol is carried out with Saccharomyces cerevisiae. On the other hand, Saccharomyces euverum has also largely been used. The Candida utilis is used for fermentation of waste sulfite liquor since it also ferments pentosis. Recently, Experimentation with Schizosaccharomyces has shown promising results. When whey from milk is used, strain of Cleoviromyces fragilis is recommended for the production of ethanol. It is also found that Fusarium, Bacillus and Pachycolon tenophilus, another yeast, can transfer pentose sugars to ethanol. It is noteworthy that the ethanol at high concentration inhibits the yeast. 
Hence, the concentration of ethanol reduces the yeast growth rate which affect the biosynthesis of ethanol. It can produce about 10-12% to 12 ethanol. The zymonas has a merit over yeast. It is relatively having high tolerance to ethanol and have more specific growth rate. Next step is preparation of inoculum. After selection of the desired organism and its isolation in pure form, the inoculum is prepared under aseptic conditions. For this purpose, the organisms are first cultured in flasks under aerobic condition to increase the size of the inoculum, which can be used for inoculation. A large amount of yeast culture is required in the industrial production of ethyl alcohol. The size of inoculum ranges from 8 to 10 percent with an average of 4 percent volume by volume. The optimum pH is 4.8 to 5 and optimum temperature is 28 to 30 degrees Celsius for yeast. The inoculum is prepared in the following sequence from test tube to flask to glass containers to small tanks or called yeast vessels and finally into the fermenter. Now what are the different raw materials which are used for the production of ethanol? Ethanol is produced from various kinds of substrates. The substrate used for ethanol production is chosen based on the regional availability and economical efficiency. Raw materials can be broadly classified into three main categories. First is sugars or saccharide materials which includes sugarcane, sugar beet, molasses, sugar corn waste, sugar or cane sorghum and some fruits. Second category includes starchy materials like Jerusalem artichokes, a species of sunflower, potatoes and sweet potatoes. Last category includes lignocellulosic waste which include maize silage, barley hull, wood and agriculture waste and paper sludges. Now we will be discussing all these types one by one. The first category is the sucrose containing materials. Since the sucrose is present in the easily available form, it could simplify the ethanol production process. Substrates included under this category includes sugarcane. Brazil is the world's second biggest ethanol producer. In Brazil, sugarcane is the major substrate for ethanol production. Countries in Central America and Caribbean are suitable for sugarcane cultivation and their ethanol production is increasing recently. Another substrate is sugar beets. Sugar beet is mainly cultivated in European countries since it grows under cold climate. These are mostly preferred. They contain 15% sugar, 82% of water and small amount of starch. A ton of sugar beet yields 20 to 25 gallons of alcohol. Use of enzymes with these sugar beets improves the alcohol yield. Another substrate is beet or cane molasses. They contain 52 to 55 percent fermentable sugars. Molasses with above 15 to 20 percent sugar content will need to be diluted. A ton yields 70 to 80 gallons of alcohol. Another substrate is sugar corn waste which contains 7 to 15 percent sugar. 8 to 18 percent gallons of alcohol is produced per ton of sugar corn waste. Back sloping that is addition of small amount of fermented products into fresh ingredient and then leaving it to be fermented is done in the range of 20 to 25 percent. Acidification is done if necessary. Sugar or cane sorghum can also be used for ethanol production. It is also a sucrose containing crop. It yields large amount of biomass and sugar due to its high photosynthetic efficiency. It has 14% fermentable sugar content. It yields 13 to 14 gallons of alcohol per ton. Acidification is necessary here. Following fruits are also a good source of sucrose. Grapes contain 15% of sucrose, banana 13.8%, apples 12.2%, pineapples 11.7%, pears 10%, peaches 7.6%, oranges 5.4% and watermelon with 2.5%.
Next category of raw materials for ethanol production includes starchy materials. Jerusalem artichokes is a species of sunflower that can be used. Abundant source of alcohol with 16 to 18% fermentable materials are present in this. A ton of this should yield about 25 gallons of alcohol. Materials should be crushed to pulp and cooked for 2 to 3 hours. Dilution is not necessary because it already contains 79 to 80% of water. Apart from this, any kind of starch containing crop can be used to produce ethanol. Many researches on ethanol production from various starchy materials such as potato, sweet potato, cassava and wheat have been investigated. Potatoes contain 15 to 18% fermentable sugars. A ton of potatoes yield 20 to 25% of alcohol. They are cooked with steam under pressure. After cooking, mash is cooled for conversion into small fermentable sugars for 15 to 20 minutes. Sweet potato contain 27 to 28% of fermentable sugars. A ton of sweet potatoes yields 40 gallons of alcohol. They are processed in similar manner to potatoes. Dilution is required for sweet potatoes. Last category includes lignocellulosic biomass. Many studies are going on for ethanol production from lignocellulosic biomass. Lignocellulosic materials include maize silage, barley hull, wood, agricultural waste and paper sludge. The difficulties of using lignocellulosic materials are their poor porosity, high crystallinity and lignin contents. In general, the sugary raw materials require mild or no pretreatments while the cellulosic materials need extensive pretreatment. Various kinds of pretreatment techniques have been investigated such as steam, acid and alkali treatments or enzyme hydrolysis to release monosaccharide units that are needed for alcohol production. Now, to sum up, we have three categories of raw materials. First, in which the sugars are readily available for the production. Second category includes starchy materials, where starch is first broken down into small fermentable sugars and then utilized for ethanol production. Third category includes lignocellulosic materials, which need pretreatments with enzymes or acids or alkali so that it can be broken down into fermentable sugars first and then utilized for ethanol production. The raw material used for the preparation of fermentation medium depends upon the agricultural produce of the country. For example, cane molasses is used in India. Generally, molasses is used as the main raw material in the preparation of fermentation medium. However, starchy materials and cellulosic materials may also be used. The optimum sugar concentration ranges between 10 to 18 percent in the fermentation medium. Also, a suitable source of nitrogen, ammonium sulfate, is added in optimum concentration. The pH of the medium is 4.8 to 5, that is highly acidic, which hinders the growth of undesirable bacteria. However, pasteurization of the medium may be practiced. Now, let us discuss about the fermentation conditions required for the ethanol production. Carbon source should contain sugar concentration in the range of 10 to 18 percent. High concentration affects the growth of yeast while low concentration makes the process uneconomical. Continuous diluters are used to get the appropriate concentration of the sugar. Nitrogen sources. Both organic and inorganic nitrogen sources are used. Mainly ammonium sulfate in the range of 0.15 gram per 2.5 gallons of molasses is used. The level of nitrogen is limited. Excess promotes yeast growth and inhibits fermentation. Growth factors are not necessary since the raw materials used satisfy the requirement of the culture. pH is maintained in the range of 4.5 to 5. Temperature of 20 to 25 degrees Celsius is optimum. Higher concentration favors the growth of bacteria and also causes loss of ethyl alcohol due to evaporation. Time duration for ethanol production is 30 to 70 hours, that is 2 to 3 days. Aeration is initially required for good growth of organism. Later, anaerobic conditions are created by withdrawal of oxygen coupled with production of carbon dioxide. 
Now, talking about the yield, on an average, 0.4 gallons of ethyl alcohol is obtained from 1 gallon of molasses. About 90% carbohydrate is converted into alcohol to produce this yield. The next slide shows the main steps involved in the ethanol production. The raw materials containing readily available sugar or raw materials containing starch includes the following steps. These are steeping, malting, sieving, milling, cooking and liquefaction that is mashing, saccharification or conversion, fermentation, centrifugation and product recovery. Whereas for lignocellulosic biomasses, the steps for ethanol production are drying, milling, slurry preparation, pre-treatment by acid or enzyme, fermentation, centrifugation and product recovery. Now let us discuss all these steps one by one in detail. The first step for saccharide or starchy materials includes steeping. In steeping, the grains are soaked in huge tank of water at 10 degrees Celsius for 2 to 3 days. Steeping of the grain is done to increase the moisture content up to 40% for germination. Second step is malting. Malting is the process where barley grain is made ready for ethanol production. Seeds are allowed to sprout or germinate. The grains are then dried. Next step after malting is sieving. It is done to remove the malt gums, which are the rootlets from the germinated grains and sold as cattle feed. Next step is milling. Milling is the mechanical crushing of the cereal grain into a fine powder called meal to release the starch components. Next step is cooking and liquefaction, important steps in preparation of mash. The meal, that is the milled grains, they are mixed with water to form a slurry which is then passed through cookers. The cooking stage is also called gelatinization. Water interacts with the starch granules when the temperature is more than 60 degrees Celsius and forms a viscous suspension. The liquefaction step is actually a partial hydrolysis of the starch into sugars that lowers the viscosity. The following enzymes can be added for breaking up the long starch chains into smaller chains. That is alpha amylase which produces dextrose from the starch and beta amylase which produce maltose from the starch. In order to accomplish liquefaction, the reaction must take place under certain conditions. The pH of the mash is maintained in the range of 5.9 to 6.2 and ammonia and sulfuric acid are added to the tank to maintain the pH. The mash is treated at 105 to 120 degrees Celsius for 2 to 7 minutes. High temperature reduces bacteria levels in the mash. To sum up, the milk grain is mixed with water and heated above 60 degrees Celsius which forms a thick suspension. Now enzymes like alpha and beta amylase are added to the mixture to break down the starch into small sugars like dextrose and maltose. This step involves partial breakdown of starch only. For complete breakdown, next step called saccharification is done. The mash from the cookers is cooled and the secondary enzyme that is glucomylase is added to convert the liquefied starch to fermentable sugars. Saccharification is the process of further hydrolysis of liquefied starch to glucose monomers which are the fermentable sugar. Glucoamylase reduces the remaining starch to dextrose or maltose. Now if we are using lignocellulosic biomass, following steps are done before fermentation. First is drying, second is milling, third is slurry preparation that is the mixing of the grounded product with the water. Fourth is pretreatment by acid or enzyme. The purpose of pretreatment is to break down the naturally recalcitrant structures of lignocellulosic biomass, which limits the bioconversion of cellulose and hemicellulose. These are the main components of lignocellulose. This pretreatment can be done using acid and alkali treatments or with enzyme hydrolysis to release monosaccharide units that are needed for alcohol production. Now the next step after these is fermentation. Yeast Saccharomyces cerevisiae is added to the mash to ferment the sugars to ethanol and carbon dioxide. 
In a continuous process, the fermenting mash is allowed to flow through fermenters where it is fully fermented and then it leaves the tank. In a batch process, the mash stays in one fermenter only for completing the fermentation. Close to 90-95% to of the glucose is converted to ethanol within 12 days producing 10% of ethanol. Next step is centrifugation. After fermentation, cells are separated by centrifugation and channeled back into the fermenter. Now after the cells are removed, the fermentation broth is further subjected to product recovery process. Ethanol from the fermentation broth can be recovered by successive distillations. However, simple distillation is not enough to get ethanol of higher concentrations. Rectification is an application of distillation process only which yields 95% ethanol. For a concentration above 95%, special techniques have to be adopted. Now let us discuss the first part of recovery process that is distillation. The fermented mash is pumped into the continuous flow multi-column distillation system where the solids and slurry mass is separated leaving the solution of alcohol and water. The concentration of alcohol in the liquid mixture is around 12 to 15 percent which means you have 85 to 88 percent water in your solution. Since ethanol is not sufficiently separated from the impurities, it is needed to further purify it. Whereas the residue mash called stillage is transferred from the base of the column to the co-product processing area. Decantation is done to obtain liquid free solids. They are dried and then used for cattle feed and fertilizers. So basically distillation is separating the liquid broth from the solid biomass. This solid biomass is further used as cattle feed and fertilizers after getting processed. Whereas the liquid which is obtained after removal of these solids contain only 12 to 15 percent of ethanol which is very low content. So to concentrate it further to higher concentrations, we use the next step that is rectification. The functioning of rectifier is similar to a distillation column only. If the distillate obtained in the previous step of distillation is distilled again and again using a rectification column, a new distillate is obtained with an even higher concentration of volatile components, which is also called rectified spirit containing 95% of ethanol. So to sum up till here, the fermentation broth was first subjected to simple distillation which separated the liquid broth from the solid biomass. This liquid broth after simple distillation contained 12 to 15 percent of ethanol. To concentrate this liquid to higher concentration, it was further subjected to rectification column, the product of which was ethanol at a concentration of 95 percent. Now with these two steps, we have obtained ethanol having a concentration of 95 percent. Now before proceeding further for the production of absolute ethanol that is with 100% concentration, let me give you an idea about the working of a rectification column. A well labeled diagram of the rectifier is shown on the given slide. Feed is the liquid that is fed into the rectification column. The tray below the inlet nozzle is called the feed tray. Higher components are components with the lower relative volatility and higher molecular weight. They are found in higher concentration in the bottom product of the column, whereas light components are components with the higher relative volatility and lower molecular weight. They are found in higher concentration at the top of the column. So basically, heavy components having low volatility will form less vapors and settle at the bottom whereas light components being more volatile will form more vapors and they are collected from the top of the column. Stripping section is basically the area containing trees between the bottom of the column and the feed tray. In the stripping section the aim is to concentrate the heavier components in the liquid phase. Since heavy components are less volatile, therefore they will not form vapors and they will be preferably be in the liquid form. 
Rectifying section is the area containing trays between the feed tray and the top of the column. In the rectifying section, the aim is to concentrate the lighter component in the vapor phase. Since the lighter components are highly volatile, they will prefer to be in vapor form. Top product is the product which leaves the top of the column. This product is usually passed through a condenser and then liquefied. In this case, the top product will be 95% ethanol. The condenser cools the ethanol vapors and pass them to the reflux drum. From the reflux drum, some of the liquid is sent back to the rectifying column called the liquid reflux so that the liquid can be distilled for more than one time. Bottom product is the product which leaves through the bottom of the column. A reboiler that is a heat exchanger is provided at the bottom of the column which boils some of the liquid leaving the column. The vapor generated returns to the column at the bottom of the stripping section. This is done to ensure that our desired product is recovered from the bottom product before it leaves the rectification system completely. The red arrows indicating the upflowing vapors are basically the light components whereas the green arrows indicating the downflowing vapor are basically the heavy components. Now the next step after rectification is to convert 96% ethanol to complete 100% ethanol. This can be done by two methods. First is by using an isotropic mixture or second is by dehydration. In first method, the 95% ethanol and 5% water obtained after rectification forms an azeotropic mixture. That is, after getting mixed at this particular concentration, the boiling point of ethanol and water is same now, that is 78.1 degree Celsius. Both ethanol and water have OH functional group that are attached to each other and strongly bound to form an azeotrope together. Now these azeotropic mixtures cannot be separated by simple distillation or rectification process alone. Therefore, for preparation of absolute alcohol, a third component, benzene or cyclohexane is added to the mixture of ethanol and water. The addition of benzene will break this azeotropic mixture and so its boiling point. Now the boiling point of ethanol increases and boiling point of water and benzene decreases. This mixture is then distilled by gradually increasing the temperature. Now since the boiling point of the ethanol has increased, the ethanol will not form vapor and will get collected at the bottom of the column. Whereas the water and benzene mixtures move out of the column from the top since their boiling points have decreased. So they will form the vapors first. The ethanol collected at the bottom of the column is 100% alcohol. The second method to obtain 100% ethanol is dehydration. The process of dehydration removes all the water. A molecular sieve composed of crystalline zeolite is used. The zeolite absorbs the water into it but the ethanol will not go into the zeolite. To sum up, we can get 100% ethanol by applying any of the two methods after the rectification process. Now there are two main co-products created in the production of ethanol. First is distiller's grain and second is carbon dioxide. Distiller's grain or distiller's dried grains with solubles, also called DDGS or stillage, they are a cereal byproduct, a mix of corn, rice and other grains of the distillation process which is used wet or dry as a highly nutritious livestock feed. Mash coming out of distillation goes into evaporators where most of the water is separated from the solid parts in the mash and is known as DDGS that is distillers dried grain with solubles or the stillage. The stillage mainly contains proteins and unconverted carbohydrates and is used as animal feed. Carbon dioxide is the second co-product which is given off in great quantities during fermentation and many ethanol plant collects, compress and sell it for use in other companies. Carbon dioxide is used to carbonate beverages and to manufacture dry ice. Carbon dioxide is also used by paper mills and other food processors. Now there are many industrial uses of ethanol. The personal care products industry is one of the largest users of industrial ethanol or ethyl alcohol.
Hair spray, mouth wash, after shave, and perfumes contain large amounts of alcohol by volume. Ethanol is also used in many deodorants, lotions, hand sanitizers, soaps, and shampoos. Denaturing Pure 100% ethanol is not generally used as a motor fuel. Instead, a percentage of ethanol is combined with unleaded gasoline. Ethanol that will be used for fuel must be denatured or made unfit for human consumption with a small amount of gasoline that is 2 to 5%. Now let us take a quick review of the ethanol production process. For saccharide or starchy materials, the first step is steeping where the grains are soaked in water. Second step is malting where the grains are allowed to germinate and then they are dried. Sieving is done to remove the rootlets or malt crumbs from the germinated seeds. Then milling is done to crush the grains into fine powder. After that cooking and liquefaction is done to produce the mash after partial hydrolysis of starch into sugars that is dextrose and maltose. Saccharification or conversion is done for complete breakdown of starch into fermentable sugar that is glucose. For lignocellulosic materials, they are first dried and then melt into fine powder. This is then mixed with water to prepare slurry. Pre-treatment is given by acid, alkali or enzymes. After treating the raw materials with their respective steps, they are subjected to fermentation. During fermentation, the sugar is fermented into carbon dioxide and ethanol. After the fermentation process is complete, the cells of yeast cells are separated using centrifuge from the fermentation broth. The fermentation broth is now subjected for product recovery. The fermentation broth is first subject to distillation column where the liquid broth is separated from the solid biomass. This results in the production of ethanol having a concentration of 12 to 15 percent. After that, to increase the concentration, it is fed to the rectification column where ethanol at a concentration of 95 percent is obtained. Absolute ethanol can be obtained by either using an isotropic mixture or by dehydration process. The solid biomass obtained during the simple distillation process is further decanted and dried to obtain distiller's grain or stillage or distiller's dried grain with solubles which are used as feed for cattle or as fertilizers. So with this we wind up the topic of industrial production of ethanol. For any doubts or queries you can contact me through the given email ID. Thank you.